You are listening to the Built to Grow podcast, delivering the knowledge in all things fitness business. We help gym owners win. Here are your hosts, Tim Lyons and Randy Angston. All right, welcome back to the Built to Grow podcast. I'm your host, Tim Lyons, in studio, Scottsdale at Profit HQ. Mm, the Built to Grow Studios. The studios. And we have a check in like location for Built to Grow Studios, too. Anyways, let me introduce <laughs> the beacon of determination, Randy Angston. What is up, buddy? How are we doing today? Good. We've got a cool little series. And before I even yes. get started with this, if any of this stuff resonates with you, that we're going to go through this and the next actually four next podcast episodes are going to be uh, growing on each other. If you have any questions, you want to jump on a call, pfmarketingsolutions.com slash call. You'll be able to jump on a call with Randy. Uh, there's a little form you fill out. You pick a time. You guys can talk about business. And I would guarantee if you don't do business with us on that call, no problem. You're going to get some extreme value and definitely get some clarity Um as to what direction you should take next. So yep. uh, we're not a hard sales company. We just want to help gyms win. And uh, that's the first step in the game. So pfmarketingsolutions.com slash call. Yeah, reach out. I look forward to talking to you. All right, cool. So got a cool kind of four part series we've just put together. Um, this the, the title of this is the 20 must haves for growth in 2020. Uh, this will be part one. We're going to have four different uh, series on this. Mm-hmm. So this this will be part one. And we've kind of identified the top 20 things that I think every gym needs to have for growth. And they're all over the board. It's not like one singular line. There's there, and, and these aren't going to be in any. We're going to try to group these as best as we can. But there's so many different little parts and pieces. Um, you may have some. You may not have any. You know what I mean? I'm sure you have some of these, obviously, oh, yeah. if you're in business, you're going to have to have some of these. But uh, you're, there's going to be some stuff that's going to raise your eyebrow like, yeah, I do need that. I don't have that. Yeah, I mean, the lists, like you said, some of them are going to be kind of foundational for business. Others are going to be more advanced. But at the end of the day, these are things that we've talked about since we started the podcast. These are things that we've built into your business, into the business of our clients. These are the th- really these are 20 things that are really going to truly take you to a different position in business and i will tell you if you have all 20 of these by the end of these like five episodes you're you're in great shape Mm -hmm. great shape okay so let's dive into it on each of these next four episodes we're going to go over five of them so right so four series we'll get five each that'll be 20 total and we'll recap some of these at the end and maybe we'll 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 kind of like refresh your memory as we go through this um so this is a great place to start right we're in 2020 we're still in january uh, we're late in January right now, but this is, uh, you know, you can put this stuff into place. You can, this will carry the test of time. This isn't a thing that you need today and then next month is gone. Yeah. That, that's never been our thing. That, that, and I think we continue to drive that yeah. p- that thought home, right? I mean, for me, not owning the gym myself mm-hmm. and being part of your facility for so long and then obviously stepping in and now helping a, a lot of gym owners do the same. The one thing that I love that we've always done differently is the fact that we've never put all of our eggs in one basket. We've always had the, the the belief and the understanding that if it's too good to be true, it probably is type of thing. Mm-hmm. So these are str- these are strategies that uh, even outside of business, uh, it's outside of fitness, these are business systems and strategies that every single type of business should have in place. Yeah, definitely foundational principles. So. Mm-hmm. So let's get into this stuff. Let's uh, let's jump right into uh, to, to the first must have. So the first must have is that you must have a brand promise. Okay, um, a lot of people are like, "What the hell is a brand promise?" <laughs> I'm gonna give you the definition of it, and I'm gonna give you some great examples, some companies that you know, and then we'll we'll kind of tie this back into fitness here. So a definition of brand promise is a statement made by an organization to its customers stating what customers can expect from their product and services. This is in terms of the benefits and experience, both the tangible and intangible, okay? The value proposition, it is the most important aspect of a brand. Boom. I mean, we talk a lot in, and you hear the marketplace or or you hear mentors and and, um, coaches and things like that talk about your brand and the impact of your brand and how to market your brand. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's crucial and it's important, but what does it even mean? What does that, you know, how do you do that? Well, a brand is more than a name. It's more than a logo or colors. It's, uh, you know, and it's 
there's there are different elements of a brand. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, the brand promises the experience, both the tangible and intangible. So this is the most important. This is the what your f- clients are feeling. Correct. When they come in contact or do business with you. Okay. And I would probably venture to guess 50% or less of gyms out there have really thought this deep. Have Especially to the degree where you could, you know, put it into a sentence, right? Put it into a sentence. Uh, you know what you think yeah. your clients think, but this is what you're trying to, to explain to them through the brand itself, okay? So it's a little abstract. You know, it's not doesn't really work well with my kind of brain where I'm very logic driven. Mm-hmm. This is more of like a little abstract thinking. So let me give you a couple examples, right? So Geico, 15 minutes or less can save you 15% or more on car insurance. That's you've heard that a million times. It's been driven into your brain cells because of every commercial on, on the air or on TV. But if you think about that, it's like in 15 minutes, I'm going to save money on car insurance, period. That's it. Yeah, and your brand promise is not your tagline. You know, it's not necessarily just a, a statement. Mm-hmm. It, it, what it does is it reinforces the relationship. When you execute that promise, the loyalty that that client has to that brand should be solidified. Perfect. Okay, so let me give you a couple others. Uh, BMW, BMW, the car maker, right? The ultimate driving machine. Mm-hmm. So when you're in that vehicle and you're experiencing what it's like driving a BMW, that loyalty is reinforced. Exactly. You know you're in a, a machine built to execute. This is an interesting one. Harley Davidson, we are Harley Davidson. That's their brand promise. You know what's weird, though? With something like Harley Davidson, be, uh, you've owned one. Yeah. And, you know, we know plenty of people that own one. Yeah. Those that have them, in, uh, 99% of them incorporate th- uh, being a Harley guy into all aspects of their lives. So we are Harley Davidson. So it's meaning we are a g- bigger than one. Exactly. This is all of us. It's a collective. It's the tribe. Mm-hmm. It's the gang, right? The, the biker gang. The uh, leathers, the <laughs> the colors, the, yeah. Exactly. So it's, so these are these are cool. Apple, think different. Okay, so that just tells you if you're going to be a customer or you're going to deal with them, this isn't going to be the status quo. Mm -hmm. They're going to push the envelope. They're going to think outside the box. So how do we relate this back to to fitness, right? Um, I had a coach a long time ago kind of give everybody a blanket uh, brand promise. It's, uh, you know, we've adopted it and we've and we and it means a lot. And I think a lot of gyms have this as a brand promise. And it's okay if you have the same brand promise. We're not so globally known that. Wait a minute. You know, yeah. we're not like Apple or Harley Davidson. It's like we're little gyms that are independent in little locations. So it's not that big of a deal to have the same one. It's just, uh, he, he's is Thomas Plummer said um, uh, we want to be the best part of our clients day every day. And that that to us meant a lot. Yeah, we, we took that up 10 years ago when we first started and, and everything that we do. We want to be the clients, the best part of our clients day, because if you think about their lives, a lot of people hate their jobs. Mm-hmm. They're not in a great relationship. They're not happy with money. Their boss yelled at them. Their dog, you know, peed on the carpet. <laughs> but then when they come to the gym, we want that to be the best part of their day. Yeah. Right? You could also say we want to be the third place. Mm-hmm. So that's another one. Work, home, gym. You know, a lot of times the, the third place for people could be Starbucks. Could be the bar, depending on who they are. Sure. We want the gym to be the third place. So... Something to think about. So brand promise, if you don't have it, start digging deep because when, and, and this goes along the lines of core values, it's almost mm-hmm. like the compass of what, how you make decisions in your business. So when we have our core values here, and we've, we've talked about core values on this episode, and we talk about this with every coaching client, is that's your compass to tell you how to make decisions mm-hmm. in your business. Uh, we've, we've used it time and time again. The one that we use the most, two of them, trust in teamwork, and do the right thing. Those are the two that we kind of lean on the heaviest. We've got eight others, uh, but do the right thing is all encompassing. Yeah. Does that mean, you know, walking that client out to their car because it's dark outside and there's no lights? Yeah, maybe that's yeah, maybe the that right does. thing. Sure. Is it, hey, this client, um, you know, didn't really tell us they wanted to put their account on freeze and we actually build them, but they really, you know, they meant to and they didn't. What, what is doing the right thing? Probably taking care of the client. Sure. So it's all encompassing. Brand promise is the same way. It's how your clients feel about your brand. Okay. So 
take that. If you want to use the same ones that we're using, cool, do it. But uh, that'll give you a good example. That's These are the top 20 things you need for growth. If you don't have that, I think that's where to start. And Brand Promise should be at you know the top of the list, one of the places you start. Um, I had a, a call with one of our coaching <laughs> clients yesterday, and I asked that question. I said, you know, what, what do you guys serve? What do you guys do? Well, we're a personal training gym. Well, tell me what. It, yeah, what does that tell me? I mean, as an end user, like, um, what I love about her situation is that she was she is a product of the product. You know, she now stepped it up in and now owns a facility. Oh yeah, previously a client. So, I told her, I said, spend some time, put yourself in the position of who you were then. What did what about this facility, this brand, attracted you to them? What what did they fulfill? that allowed you to believe in that brand what did they promise what did they execute and what did you believe in perfect and uh yeah i mean that really resonated with with them and, and she'll spin that into her marketing message exactly Very yeah cool. so now she can she can start top down you know and start to strategically plan some content around it create some language things like that but she has to she has to know what she what she serves and coming up with a brand promise or understanding her brand promise is a great way to begin beautiful okay Number one. Number two, I think you have to have goals. Yes. You have to have <clears throat> goals. You have to have something that you're working towards week in, day in, month in, year in, year out. Every year you need to have goals. And your goals could be um, client-driven metrics. You could say, hey, I want to. we want to lose 10,000 pounds of fat this year. That could be a goal. Um, you want to Maybe you want to have uh, more clients in general. I want to have 500 clients uh, by the end of the year. That's a goal. Yeah, what's our buddy Jason's Phillips? Was it like 10 million? He wants to, yeah. Is it 10 he, million? Oh, he wants to serve a, a billion or something. It was, yeah, it was something incredible. But again, major, big goal, very definitive, very easy to understand yep. how you go and execute it. Yep, yep. So goals are, are absolutely essential. If you're not putting goals, and again, we talked about it, writing them down, it's not a and dating it when that, that, that goal is going to happen, just a wish, you're kind of just floundering around. Flound, you know, you don't, you're not really looking at anything. Are we going up, going down? You need to have a goal, and you should have multiple goals on di every dis different aspect of the gym. Yeah. You know, each client has their own goals. Maybe your training department has goals for training sessions served. Maybe your sales department has total sales generated this month. That's a goal. The business owner might have a net profit goal or a time freedom goal mm -hmm. or any of those things. You need to have goals. You need to have, I mean, this isn't anything you haven't heard before, but it might might be the just the one thing that I tell you right now, like, okay, I need to do it. Yeah, and, and it might be as simple as writing them down and dating them, mm -hmm. you know, like taking them from your, your mind and making it a real goal, like Tim said. Otherwise, it's it's really just a wish. You're just kind of floating through. Um, the Again, back to, you mentioned it recently in the podcast, I was getting through Seth Godin's This Is Marketing, mm -hmm. and he broke goals down in, in a way that really resonated with me because it's the way that I break down goals and I think that we do as a business it's goals, strategies, and tactics. Okay. So your goal is your overall objective. What are you trying to achieve? Okay, let's do, let's do this as an example. So let's say we're trying to achieve, um, trying to achieve another 30 clients this quarter. Okay, so 30 clients is our goal. In how are we going to, uh, how, how do we achieve that goal? Well, then we step down and we look at our strategies. What are strategies that we can implement to reach our goal? Um, social media marketing, uh, direct mail marketing, a referral campaign. Um, these are different strategies within that goal that will support and okay, you know, execute that goal. Now the tactics support the strategy. Okay. So social media marketing, okay, we're going to set up a Facebook ad campaign and the tactic would be the actual ad that supports that strategy. So what is the language? What is the copy? What is the imagery? Mm -hmm. Those tactics can change within a strategy Perfect. that can change within your goal. So, okay, tactics for social media, Facebook, Instagram, SEO maybe. Now we got direct mail. We've got our tactics could be variations on the actual imagery and the, the, the flyers that the we're offer. sending out. The offer itself exactly is a tactic. Those can change, but the strategy remains the same. Yep. And then the goal, they all support the goal. So it's almost like a, a, a pyramid effect or a tiered system. Yeah. And uh, remember, guys, your goal doesn't change. You know, you stick to your goal. Your strategies support your goal. 
And those can be, you can have multiple strategies to support a goal. And then your tactics support the strategies that support the goals. Yep. And those obviously, you know, can be very, very wide. Beautiful. So, I think that's going to help people understand a little bit better. But it's breaking it down by piece. Strategy. So goal on top, strategy, tactics underneath. The it. reason I really like this, and especially for uh, for the, the coaches or the, the uh, gym owners and the clients that we've served over the last few years, is when, when we have a goal, okay? So let's say we want to add 30 clients this quarter. Most, more often than not, uh, the gym owners that we've worked with or the assumption is I need, well, the only thing that they're concerned about is the tactics. There's no strategy. What is the ad copy? Exactly. Say? What is the hook? What is the, what is this proprietary challenge that nobody's heard of that's going to, you know, drive people into my gym? Guys, all of those things change all of the time. The strategy that's in place doesn't change to support that type of goal. And these are just the tactics that, that are replaceable. They're like the the plays in a football field, right? You don't change. You don't say, you know, you got offense and you got defense. Those are like your strategies. When you're trying to put more points on the board, you don't throw your defense out there and say, hey, you know, let's switch everything up and let's go with a different strategy. No, the the, the objective is to put more points on the board. You do that with your offense and you do that with the tactics, the plays that you're using to support that offense. Yep. Great point. I think that's a great definition because, yes, everybody's focused on what does the ad copy say, which is 100% a tactic that's just floating around out there without a, 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 like a strategy behind it mm-hmm. and a goal on top of it. So it's like you get start, start with your goal first, work backwards, and then you can have multiple strategies, which is our poles in the water. Mm-hmm. Then you can have multiple tactics below each strategy. Exactly. And that's the way to build a true system and, and, and complete strategy around your goals. If you guys, if you're still looking for the next shiny ball when it comes to the tactic that's getting people in gyms, you're behind the eight ball. Yep. Like understand that that's never going to get you in the position to grow sustainably long term. And that's the reason that we're putting this list together. Perfect. And that, and that goal being like a net positive 30 clients, that could also, another part of that strategy could be retention. Absolutely. Because if you're not losing anybody and you're only gaining, that's, that's the best. So you want to reduce your attrition while you're gaining clients, and then we have a net positive 30 clients this month. That's smart. Quarter. So, yeah, so those listening, if you have an objective to add a net positive you know, client base, assume one of those strategies is a retention strategy. Right. With multiple tactics within it. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> See how this works? Yep. Guys, if you want more info, pfmarketingsolutions.com slash call. Get on with Randy. We'll, we'll walk you through all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, number three, which is the complete opposite of what you would think. We're going to actually start this one up with number three is you got to have an exit plan for your business for 2020. Not now. I'm not saying you need to get out of your business in 2020. You need to have a plan in place that you're working towards, that your decisions are based on. If your exit plan is to sell, you need to. Ha- we talked about it uh, with your P and Ls. You got to get your numbers right. You got to have your systems in place. Nobody's going to buy a business that's all in your head and nothing's written down and nobody knows what's going on except for you. So if your exit plan is to sell, cool then work towards that and all of your decisions should be around that. If you don't have an exit plan, what are you really doing? You're just kind of just working every day in day out. Yeah. You bought yourself a job. Yeah. You buy, well, you not necessarily bought yourself a job, but you're just going down a path that you have no idea what the end goal is. So mm-hmm. think about what is the ultimate goal for your business could be to sell. It could be to keep it and have multiple locations. It could, it is, it could be to keep it and have one, that pays you like a stock, like you own the business and it's just paying you a dividend every month or every two weeks and you're getting a paycheck, but you're doing something else. Your exit plan should probably never be to continue to be a trainer that, that you're trading time for money. That shouldn't be anywhere in anybody's plan. Sure. If you're out there on the training floor and the only way your business operates is if you push the buttons and you do the work, you got to think harder and you got to work yourself. You, you have a job. Okay, and that that's not a business. And we've we've really heavy on the Kiyosaki four quadrant cash flow formula. That is the not the place that you want to be in. Understand, it's not a bad thing to have time on your schedule that you might choose to be on the training floor as a business owner. That is a choice, and understand that you can build a business that allows you that choice. What Tim's getting at is the fact that you don't want it to be a must, meaning. If you're not on the training floor earning a wage for those hours traded, you're not being paid 
or the business isn't making money, that's a, you know, that's a linchpin. That's something that needs to change. There's systems there, staffing structure and things like that to allow you to have a business as a standalone asset that allows you your choice where you want to spend your time and how much in your business. Yeah. Yep. So not a must, but definitely have a exit plan. Yeah, exit plan. Yeah. I mean, for me, my exit plan, just kind of let you all know is, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in it. I'm currently in it right now. This was the design for, for me was to have a business that runs and operates without me, pays me, pays itself. It's self-sustaining, system driven. Everything's fine. My, my goal is to own a, uh, real estate, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at building a shopping center, putting the gym in the center, o owning the real estate where the gym is in the center. I will be the landlord and, and as well as the landlord for, you know, 10, 15 other tenants. And that's our goal, right? So we're working towards that. We've got, we got properties located and we're, we're starting that, that kind of plan, but that's my plan. I feel like you know, I hate to say it, I don't think you're going to retire owning one gym. I think you can retire and, and build wealth owning real estate well up better than owning a business. Well, it's personally. and going back to our cash flow quadrants, that takes you from the business owner role and steps you into the investor role. Investor role. Where yeah. now your your capital is making money perfect uh, for itself. So, Okay, so exit goal. If you don't have it, here you go. If you don't have a brand promise, get it build it do it today you know you, the, the longer you wait on this stuff the further you can get behind this is for growth right for mm -hmm. trying to grow in 2020 and beyond you're gonna need to have this stuff so get it get it done today um, all right number four a daily plan a daily plan and a daily plan of attack is so important because what is it that you're seeing on most you, you do these calls yeah. so Randy yeah. in our coaching program um, the very first week, this is one of his exercises, and I'll let him tell you about it. But but some of the things coming back, you know, it's it's very similar. Almost they're all the same. Yeah, yeah, quite often. Um, and and it's I love that. And at the same time, you know, it's something that we can address pretty kind of easily, right? Because we we've seen this over and over and over. Your daily plan should be a condensed version or a like the microscopic view of your overall goal, in my opinion. So when I goal set with our clients, I always say, all right, what's your overall objective? And uh, I throw the business right off the bat. My personal goal through coaching and through mindset is to create a life for these gym owners and w using their business as a tool and a vessel to get there. Like we talk about, right? Being a true business owner, having an exit plan, most of the clients that are working with us don't want to be in the business training on the training floor 40 hours a week. So knowing that fact and working with them what is their overall goal? Okay, they want a quality of life. They want certain hours a day in their facility and so forth. Then we work retroactively. Okay, How, where are we today? Where I have them, what I have them do right off the bat in the first week is do uh, their daily activities broken down hourly as it is today. Yep. Then I have them do that in an ideal situation. If you were to sit and, and do your daily hour breakdown of your ideal perfect day, what does that look like? So now I have a before and after. And between the two is the delta. What do we need to do in order to make your left current situation look like your right? Mm -hmm. Daily action, you know, daily plans. Well, more often than not, when I get those daily plans as they are today, there's a lot of confusion on where they should be spending their time. How do I get from here to here? Right. And so that's where we get into intention and setting your daily goals and your plans. Most often, more often than not, business owners, when they first come to us, are going into their days retro, um, uh, reactively Reactive, yeah. and not proactively. And so one of the things being so driven for growth we break down our daily plans with actionable steps that are going to help support the weekly goal, that are going to help support the monthly goal, your yearly goal, and then eventually your exit plan. And uh, what we do is we, as we break down your, your day, daily activities that you're kind of f finding yourself doing and required to do on a daily basis, we're going to take that list and we're going to prioritize it. Um, and how do you do that? literally write a list. So everything that you do in a normal day to day, um, I, perfect example, I just did this with, with Danny this week, one of our newest coaching clients, write down all the, the one thing that I'm finding in with gym owners is everybody has admin work. Everybody has office work. Everybody has these things that aren't on the training floor. That's not doing payroll, but they are not, um, on the training floor or not doing, um, 
sales or anything? Yeah, sales or client-facing so you know, that, activities. That's their, that's their code word for busy work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we all know that you guys wear a million hats, and there's a million things that you got to do. Sometimes it's payroll. Sometimes it's accountability for clients. It's program design. It's whatever it may be. Write that list. Go through that list. You have a team of people that support your business and, and you in your business. One of the things that we work with gym owners on is delegation. Is there people in your organization that not only can, but should have certain responsibilities that are sitting on your plate? So for our latest client, that was exactly what I did. 50, almost 50% of the list was things that other people in her organization should have on their plate. She's just never coached them up. She didn't know that they should be doing these types of things. So we worked on, on kind of an understanding. She did a little, got a, dug a little deeper and realized like her, um, her accountability admin should be doing the, the daily client touch points, not just, you know, weekly posts, weekly emails, things like that. Uh, this gym owner was spending uh, time every single day sending one quarter of their clientele personalized videos, which is phenomenal. But coming from a business owner who's doing that versus somebody who she is literally paying to be the accountability specialist within her facility, pass that off. Yep. I know we have the belief that if somebody in your organization can do the work at 80% or so effectively as, as you can, that is a task that you can and you, you should be able to hand off to that individual and then continue to coach them from there. So that's that was my uh, goal for her for this week was take that list of admin work that she's doing, 50% of it I want it to go away. I want 50% of this list to go to other people in her organization. Mm -hmm. She loved that idea because right now time is her biggest yeah. you know, burden. And really the, the, the goal here is to free up time so then clarity can then drip in and then you can see clearly of what needs to happen because what happens is your head's down as a gym owner. I've been mm -hmm. there, I've been mm -hmm. there over there. And you're just putting fires out, you're getting stuff done, you feel like you're busy, busy, busy. At the end of the day, what are, what really what was a net positive? It's usually negative or zero. Yeah, and a perfect example. I'm working with another brand new coaching client, uh, Ryan. Successful mm -hmm. gym, things are going well. Um, he's very good at what he does. Uh, you know, accomplishes a number of things, multitude of things at one time. But when I had him do his daily activities as he is today, he came to me and he goes, "Holy shit, man! Like, mm -hmm. no, there's no joke. No wondering why I'm not growing." Mm -hmm. He goes, "I have no time to do anything that's not on the training floor, training clients." I have no time as a gym owner. He's not doing anything to support the growth of the organization. And it was a big eye opener for him. And so um, if you know what you're what you're doing, we talk about it all the time. Priorities are not set on where your intentions lie. Your priorities are are truly where you spend your time. Yeah. And this is the way that we can control, force your calendar, force your schedule, prioritize your days. I am huge on setting your intention in the morning. Literally write out the list of everything that you, you plan on, on doing that day and then prioritize that list. A's must happen. Uh, there's a really good book called Eat, uh, Eat This Frog. Um, I think it's a, is there a Brian Tracy? Not sure. It, it may, might be a Brian Tracy book. But um, what he does is he, he alphabetizes his priorities. A's, non-negotiables. Those have to, be, have to be done that same day. When you, ha when you set your list of tasks to do, prioritize them based on importance, and then always start with the most important tasks first. There's a reason that we push off the important things and we do the easy things. It's because we, we assume that we can just blast through all of this easy work, yep. and then, okay, now I can attack the hard stuff. But yep. at the end of the day, the things that move the needle are the, the difficult things. Yeah. It's the priorities. In our opinion, the things that make you money, income-producing activities move to the top of the list, Typically, I mean, more often than not, and then the rest follow. Following up with emails that aren't crucial, 911 fires, move, move it to the end of the day. Um, you know, content, creating content for the week, that type of thing, move to the end of the day. Things that are going to make you money, things are going to move the needle, prioritize those in your day, uh, and then execute one by one by one. Perfect. Perfect. So that's a daily plan. And that could also build out into a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual. And it should. Yeah. And, and the, the big takeaway there is there's probably going to be things on that daily plan. I know there will be that that you shouldn't be doing. And the takeaway is that you need to off, off, offload that stuff to admins or coaches mm -hmm. or, or, you know, operations people. So you as the owner, the visionary, when you clear your ha head and get rid of things, you can now focus on the growth. And, wh and one of the things, working with the mindset of the gym owners that we're working with, a lot of the time the belief is because I can't uh, – 
because it's in front of them and they know that they can go do it, they're doers. They're the, yeah, they're going to execute. But the problem is they're they're putting themselves in a position to just rely on themselves all the time instead of the team that they're paying to do the work. Mm-hmm. And they can't put their time and attention into the areas they really need to be spending time and attention. Mm -hmm. So those items get dropped. They never get addressed. The growth of the facility doesn't take place because you're busy in the business every day instead of working on the business. And when you can free up time from tasks, delegate, allow your, you know, maybe it's a collective, you know, maybe you share some of those responsibilities with the team, but it's not all sitting on your shoulders. And when you could do that, then boom, opens up your time, now you can work on income producing activities. Wonderful thing. So there, you know, that's why we put that that particular, you know, must have in this episode because it's it's as important as anything else. You know, if you can structure your day, that's going to make you more efficient, and then you can focus on these other things like number five, having a budget, and then using the budget for as a tool. So most everybody. Nah, you know what? I bet you there is no, there's probably not a whole lot of people that are actually budgeting. They're looking at your P&Ls and then making adjustments from there. But if you allocate funds, that's technically budgeting. This month, I want to spend 15% of of gross revenue on marketing. That's my budget. And you got to stay within that budget. Like we do budgets a lot for events like our Christmas party. We had a budget and we broke it down and we we had like gifts that we're going to be doing and we had to make sure we stayed in that. But that's budgets. That's budgeting, not looking at your P&Ls. So going, this is more of a proactive, whereas a P&L is reactive. Like a P&L is just a report of what happened last month. It's data. Yeah. What you need to say is like, okay, we're going to be bringing this much in next month. And out of that, I want to spend X amount on payroll, rent. This is kind of already spoken for Mm -hmm. now i've got marketing i've got office supplies and things like that having a written budget to know that i got to stay below this and if you do go above you blow the budget on something you're gonna have to peel something off on Mm -hmm. the other end at the end of the day you want to have at least 20 percent net profit that's kind of the goal for us it's 30. Um, i would tell you that the the norm is eight to twelve percent it's probably because of this reason that they're going backwards they're they're being reactive on last month's p l so take a look at your entire last year. Okay, this is what I would do. Take a look at the entire last year and then go line by line on every expense. That's, that's what you're budgeting. You're, ex- you're budgeting your expenses. Mm-hmm. You're not really budgeting your income yeah. because that's... N- Unknown. Well, That's forecasting though. Yeah, it's forecasting. Budgeting is, is your expenses. Make sure, uh, you know, for us, our big initiative is net profit mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going backwards and cutting out subscriptions yeah we talked about that this week yeah yeah to our iron circle so you're getting a little inside scoop of what we talked about in the iron circle it's let's go back and look at anything that you spent money on last year and l- is it absolutely dire did it drive is there a return on investment you know and return on investment could be the client experience so we went out and bought diffusers for the gym mm-hmm. we got sent blown into this into the facility so that's technically yeah yeah you guys gotta come check it out it's like walking into the hard rack yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Scent. Well, that goes into our customer experience, which will be in, a, in an, another one of these uh, series of this, this thing is, is, is customer experience. But having a budget and reviewing the budget with either your accountant or your fitness director or somebody that's also spending money in your facility that they know, like, you can only spend this much money on this one particular line. Wh- whoever is marketing. Whoever's I mean, we're talking about growth. That's probably one of the largest areas to, yeah. you know, of your budget as far as um well, you know, re, re-aligning funds, you know, putting it towards future growth would yep. be your marketing budget. But you have to know I think which ones are wins, where to spend, and how much you should be spending. Yeah, and this is a question that we get. How much should I be spending on marketing? Yes. This is kind of a – there's going to be a rule of thumb, and then there's a thing that's reality. The rule of thumb is, you know, and, and I think it, I think about $40,000 in gross revenue per month, it changes where the percentage is. But let's just say you're making less than $40,000 a month. You probably should be spending about 15% of gross revenue on marketing. So let's say you're making $30,000. That's like five grand a month. Okay? If you're making $40,000, that wouldn't be um, – Six thousand. But it was here. We go with the math again. Dang, you got a calculator in front of you. <laughs> I, do, I do. So let's just say you're making fifty grand a month in gross revenue. Ten um, percent of that would be five. Fifteen percent would be seventy five hundred. That would be about right. Seventy five hundred bucks between five and seventy. So between ten and fifteen percent of gross revenue. Now, just spending the money is one thing. Now, if you find a winning campaign, 
scale scale it up because if for every dollar when it comes to marketing when you invest a dollar and you're making a dollar fifty or two back well then that budget doesn't matter you spend as much as you possibly can because you're making a return on your investment you're just uh, uh multiplying capital yeah it's it, it's an atm situation right or uh you don't just so like like going out and spending money on a billboard or a direct mail campaign where you can't really measure measure the results accurate ROI yeah maybe you do it maybe you don't I wouldn't recommend it but let's say you did do it um, you don't know what you're making back on that mm -hmm. and sometimes that return isn't happening until the next month or the next month after that but if you're over here on Facebook running digital marketing you can see your ROAS which is a return on ad spend and I could see immediately I'm making two point five ROAS. Well, then the 10% doesn't matter. Mm -mm. Th there is no percentage. It is spend as much as possible to make that return because you're multiplying capital on the dot. So that's the one thing that is really a moving target. I would say at least budget 10%, but then when you find a winning campaign, scale to the moon if you can until you start losing. So that that's budgeting. And strike while the iron's hot when it comes to marketing. Just a, a little caveat there because what works today again, tactic wise might not work six months from now. So if you have a winning campaign that you can scale until you get to that, you know, the, the row is starting to depreciate or, or decline, mm -hmm. continue to invest in, in that, those campaigns because that's where your, your true growth can, re, can you can really you accelerate can scale, that. Yeah. yeah. Fast. You can scale that bad boy. So there you have it. Our first five, no particular order. We put these five first because they made the most sense. We have a list of 20. We're going to take this over four different episodes. This is part one. Guys, if any of this stuff resonated with you, if you think that um, you need a little bit of help in any of these areas from today on the next four episodes, get on a call, book a call, pfmarketingsolutions.com slash call. You're going to pick a time. You're going to have a little uh, woo-foo form, like this is called a breakthrough call form. We're just going to get some more information about you so we can kind of look up your website and kind of check your business out a little bit so we're prepared on our calls. Um, and then, yeah, jump on a call with Randy. We're going to dive deep and see if we can help you. If you think you need help, th this is the time, right? Yeah. Jump on. Let's get stuff knocked out. Um, we'll help you through these 20 and 20 more other things because there's all these little parts and pieces throughout your business that, you know what, they all go together, but they're all separate at the same time. So hopefully that helped you. Look, I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to these next three episodes after yeah, this one. I really like this. I yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going deep into the weeds a little bit on some of this stuff and, and why we think these are the top 20 for growth. These are the top 20 must haves. You must have these in your business for growth in 2020. And if you want to grow, you got to have these. If you don't want to grow, then don't have these. I don't know what mm -hmm. to tell you. It's pretty cut and dry. You want to <laughs> grow, jump on these things. So we're hopefully, we're giving you the goodies. We're giving you the stuff that, that you need to win. Um, if you need help, again, jump on a call, pfmarketingsolutions.com slash call. I'm off to a meeting. Guys, until next time, keep changing lives. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye.